On September 13, 2020, a small experimental airplane was flying across Florida under an IFR flight plan. The aircraft was operating legally. The engine was running normally. There was no distress call, no emergency declared, and no sign of a mechanical problem. And yet, a short time later, that airplane would break apart in midair and disappear into the Gulf of Mexico. When accidents like this happen, our instinct is often to look for something obvious, a system failure, a bad decision, a clear mistake. But in this case, when you first look at the flight, everything appears reasonable. So the question becomes a little uncomfortable. What went wrong when everything looked normal on paper? The airplane involved was a Vans RV-9A, an experimental amateur-built aircraft commonly used for cross-country flying. It's a design known for efficiency, range, and relatively gentle handling, especially compared to some of the more aerobatic aircraft in the same family. On this day, it was being used exactly as many owners use it, for a personal cross-country flight. The flight departed from Jack Edwards Airport in Gulf Shores, Alabama, with Ocala, Florida as the intended destination. The pilot had filed an IFR flight plan, which on the surface made sense. Weather along the route was not ideal, and flying under instrument flight rules allows for better separation, structured routing, and assistance from air traffic control. On board were two people. The pilot held a commercial certificate, and the passenger was a certificated student pilot. Neither occupant was fully instrument qualified for severe weather operations, but the flight itself was legal and there was nothing to suggest that it began as anything other than a routine trip. For the first part of the flight, things progressed without incident, but as the airplane moved farther east, the weather ahead began to deteriorate. This is not unusual. Weather rarely changes all at once. It tends to worsen gradually, giving pilots a series of small decisions rather than one dramatic turning point. About one hour and 45 minutes into the flight, the pilot requested a diversion. Instead of continuing toward Ocala, he asked to head toward Cross City Airport. That decision alone doesn't stand out as risky. In fact, it's often the exact opposite. Diverting early is usually a sign of good judgment, an acknowledgement that conditions ahead may no longer be favorable. At this stage, nothing about the flight appears extraordinary. A legal IFR airplane, a pilot responding to changing weather, and a decision to divert toward a closer airport. Many pilots watching this would recognize themselves in that scenario. And that's what makes this accident so unsettling. Because if this was a reasonable plan, flown legally, with a diversion already underway, how did it end with an airplane breaking apart in midair? To answer that, we need to look away from the cockpit for a moment and focus on something that doesn't always get the respect it deserves. The weather. On the day of the accident, Tropical Storm Sally was active in the Gulf of Mexico. Its center was not directly over the aircraft's route, and that detail is important because it's where many misunderstandings begin. When pilots think about tropical systems, they often picture the eye of the storm, the strongest winds, the most obvious danger. But tropical systems don't work that way. Far from the center of the storm, rotating rain bands can stretch hundreds of miles outward. These rain bands are not just areas of steady rain. They often contain embedded thunderstorms, strong wind shear, and extremely powerful vertical air movement. And because they can appear less dramatic on basic weather displays, they are easy to underestimate. These are not normal thunderstorms. Inside tropical rain bands, the atmosphere can be deeply unstable. Warm, moist air rises rapidly, while cooler air sinks just as aggressively nearby. The result is a vertical tug of war, with air moving up and down at rates that can be difficult to imagine if you've never encountered it. In this case, meteorological analysis showed that some of the rain bands near the flight path were capable of producing vertical air movements on the order of 10 to 12,000 feet per minute. That number is worth pausing on for a moment. Most light aircraft are designed to climb at a few hundred feet per minute, under normal conditions. Even a strong downdraft or updraft in non-convective weather might be measured in the low thousands. But 10,000 feet per minute is different. At that point, the airplane is no longer really flying through the air. The air itself is moving violently around the airplane. This is where a very important concept comes into play. An aircraft does not need to be mishandled, oversped, or aggressively maneuvered to be overstressed. 
If the air mass surrounding it is accelerating rapidly upward or downward, the forces transmitted through the wings and structure can increase dramatically in a very short time. And that danger is largely invisible. On many cockpit displays, heavy rain looks like heavy rain. Embedded convection can hide inside larger weather systems, especially when the storm structure is spread out over a wide area. A pilot may see areas of precipitation and believe they are manageable, without realizing just how energetic the air inside those clouds really is. So as the RV-9A continued toward Cross City, it was not simply flying toward bad weather. It was moving closer to a part of the atmosphere that was actively unstable, powerful, and unforgiving. At this point, the airplane still hadn't done anything wrong. The pilot hadn't lost control. There was no mechanical failure, but the environment around the aircraft was becoming increasingly hostile. And soon, another layer of protection, one that pilots often rely on more than they realize, would quietly fail as well. As the airplane continued toward Cross City, the pilot was still in contact with air traffic control. He requested and received an IFR approach clearance. From the outside, this can feel reassuring. Clearances are structured, orderly, and familiar. They give the impression that everything is under control. But this is where something subtle and very important happened. At the time the approach clearance was issued, hazardous weather information was available. Center weather advisories had already been published, warning of scattered moderate to heavy rain showers and thunderstorms in the area. These advisories are specifically meant to highlight weather that could affect the safety of flight, particularly for aircraft operating under IFR. None of that information was passed to the pilot. Now, it's important to be clear about what this does and does not mean. An IFR clearance does not remove a pilot's responsibility for weather avoidance. Pilots are still expected to evaluate conditions and make conservative decisions. But when hazardous weather information is available, air traffic control is required to pass it along. That information is meant to be one of several layers protecting the flight. In this case, that layer never reached the cockpit. Without those advisories, the pilot had no formal indication from ATC that the weather ahead was more than just rain or moderate turbulence. And when you combine that with an already stressful situation, deteriorating weather, a diversion, and the workload of flying and approach, it becomes easier to see how the full severity of the environment might not have been obvious in real time. This is a good moment to pause and think about how accidents often develop. Rarely is there a single failure that causes everything to fall apart. Instead, multiple small gaps begin to align, a decision that makes sense on its own, weather that looks manageable at first glance, and then a missing piece of information that could have shifted the outcome. None of these factors alone explains what happened, but together they start to form a picture. And the final piece of that picture comes from the data. Based on the data available, the final moments of the flight happened very quickly. A DSB information shows the airplane entering a left turn toward an area of heavier precipitation. Shortly after that, the aircraft began descending rapidly. The recorded descent rate reached approximately 6,450 feet per minute before radar contact was lost entirely. It's tempting to look at a number like that and immediately assume overspeed or aggressive maneuvering, but this is where careful interpretation matters. Vertical speed and airspeed are not the same thing. A very high descent rate can occur even when indicated airspeed remains within normal limits, especially in a strong downdraft. In convective weather, the air itself can be moving downward faster than the airplane is capable of climbing. When that happens, the aircraft is effectively being carried along by the atmosphere. Structural loads are driven by acceleration, by how quickly forces change, not simply by how fast the airplane is moving forward. A sudden transition from a powerful updraft to an equally powerful downdraft or a sharp change in wind direction can impose enormous loads on the airframe in a matter of seconds. And that's exactly the environment the airplane was entering. When the wreckage was later recovered from the Gulf of Mexico, investigators found clear evidence of an in-flight breakup. Major components, including parts of the wings and empennage, had separated before the aircraft impacted the water. Just as importantly, there was no evidence of a mechanical failure that could explain the breakup. The engine showed no signs of pre-impact malfunction. The flight control systems did not reveal any failures, and there were no indications of flutter, fatigue, cracking, or improper maintenance. The fractures observed in the structure were overload fractures. This type of damage occurs when a structure is subjected to forces far beyond what it was designed to withstand all at once. 
it is sudden, not progressive, and it leaves little room for recovery. So what does that tell us? It tells us that the airplane did not come apart because it was weak, and it did not come apart because the pilot intentionally overstressed it. It came apart because the forces acting on it exceeded its design limits in an environment where control margins disappeared almost instantly. At that point, the outcome was no longer something skill alone could change. When accidents involve experienced pilots and capable airplanes, there's often a tendency to look for a moment where things could have been handled better, and in many cases that's a fair question. But this accident points us in a slightly different direction. The Vans RV-9A is a capable cross-country aircraft. It's efficient, stable, and well-suited for the type of flight it was conducting. But like all light aircraft, it is not designed to withstand the forces found inside severe convective weather, especially within tropical rain bands. No light aircraft is. An IFR clearance does not make the weather safe. It does not smooth out turbulence, weaken updrafts, or reduce structural loads. It simply provides separation and guidance. Physics still applies, regardless of whether an airplane is certified, experimental, VFR, or IFR. This brings us to the question many viewers will naturally ask. Could the pilot have saved it? Based on what we know, once the aircraft entered that environment, there may have been no remaining margin to work with. When vertical air movement exceeds an aircraft's climb or descent capability, control authority can be overwhelmed. And once structural limits are exceeded, recovery is no longer possible, no matter how quickly or skillfully the pilot reacts. That doesn't mean decisions earlier in the flight were meaningless. Weather avoidance, especially around tropical systems, remains one of the most important tools pilots have. But this accident reminds us that legality and survivability are not the same thing. It also reminds us how easily risk can build without announcing itself. A legal flight, a reasonable diversion, an IFR clearance, and then an environment that simply does not forgive. And that is perhaps the most important lesson here. Some weather is not something to be managed. It is something to be avoided entirely. And recognizing the difference, early enough to act on it, can be the difference between a routine diversion and an outcome that no one can change.